I went back to the curtain, like events and everyone's like clapping and like even Mike Hayes like God, you you did something special tonight. And I was like, really? If Brock is your friend, he will give you the shirt off his back. Mm. Nice guy in the world, fun, cool to hang around with. If he doesn't like you, he's a, he's what you what you're seeing on TV. That's not an act. Whose idea was it for your mama? One, Mr. McMahon. <laughs> Well, look, the first thing that we need to talk about right off the bat, because everybody's thinking it, is you look the exact same. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I get that a lot. And I'm like, you know, uh, sometimes I, I look the same. I don't I don't always feel the same. But, you know, I'm just glad I, you know, I just took care of myself. You are I, undefeated I, against aging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every, every, age age wins every time. Like eventually it's, it's, it's going to get me. No one's immune to it. Um, like I said, I, I've luckily I've been blessed to to look and feel like a young kid. Matter of fact, I'm at a I'm here in Vegas at a video game convention to show you what kind of big kid I am. So. <laughs> and you're not here alone. You're here nah. with all your gamer friends. Yeah, Woods, uh, you know, my partner Cedric. You know, they're all, they're all back at the hotel. Like I said, I'll drag them here next time. But you know, <laughs> yeah. When I met you backstage in Houston at Booker T's show, Reality of Wrestling, right. I I knew you were a big dude. But then I met you in person. I'm like, man, like your arms are the size of like a normal human's head. <laughs> hey, like I said, I just hang out and work out all day. Like, because when when you hang out with Bobby Lashley, <laughs> he makes like, you feel small. Ex exactly. It's like you know, I, I, I at least got to look like I I could you know hold my own against him. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, call it call it ego. Call it call it you know little friendly competition. But uh, yeah, I. I just enjoyed looking good, so I work out. So, like, what's your workout split look like right now? Um, I probably go every other day, like not not every okay. day, every probably every other day. Um, and I, I just kind of go, you know, I go for one body part. Like, I literally go to the gym forty five minutes. I work one body part. So you're like you're on the they call it the bro split, right? Right. So, Chest one day back when i'm on exactly. the same split yeah. yeah so that and and then you know i'll run a few times uh a week you know just to keep my weight down because i i bulk really fast so i i and i don't i don't want to be the big bulky guy you know what i mean like well, especially in a you know in a profession where you're out there in your underwear every week you right. know like yeah like like i said i i want to look good but i i like like i said bobby is like oh my god and i wanted to you know when i think about it i I listen to women and I hear women go, Oh my God, he's just, he's too big. And then they go to another guy who's in good shape. Oh, he's sexy. I say, I want sexy. <laughs> I, I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't want the Hulk. I want Thor. <laughs> so I I'm honored to be sitting here with a future hall of famer because uh, you, I mean, you know, it Shawn Michaels said, whenever you're ready to hang him up, they've got a spot for you in the hall of fame. Yeah. And that, that, you know, coming from Shawn Michaels, that was a huge compliment to me. Like I, even when he said it, I was like, "Oh, wow!" Like, you know, you 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 don't really think about that stuff when you get into business. I was just thinking, get in wrestling and have fun because I grew up watching wrestling. So to be, you know, even in that conversation of being a, a Hall of Famer for me, it's like, wow! It's not even a conversation anymore. Right. You are <laughs> you, you are a future Hall of Famer. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I can't own it yet. Not until it's over. Like it, because again, it's still for me. It's like, yeah, when I got into it, I did. I thought I would be done by now. I thought I'd be done ten years ago. Yeah. So yeah, to be again, to be in that conversation, uh, I'm, I'm honored. Did he reach out to you before that, or did you just see it in that video package uh, and you're like, wait a second, what did he just say? Yeah, that was my first time seeing it. No way. Like, I had no idea. Cause I know they they were putting it together for like I said my twenty year anniversary. Um, I didn't even know about that to be honest. I, I thought I thought they forgot, <laughs> and uh, so no no one said anything. And so when when the actual date hit, and then I started getting all these messages of the messages from the office and seeing, you know, the video package and everything else. You know, I don't know why they put Mia Yim in that, but we'll talk about that later. But uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was like. You know, it was like humble, like tear in the eye type situation for me. Like, because again, I didn't think I would. I I didn't I didn't have this in mind when I got into 
pro wrestling. But when you look back at your career, I mean, it's obvious. This is a Hall of Fame career. Yeah, I mean, arguably. No, um, it's not an argument. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, like I said, I look back at my career and I, there's so many moments that I, you know, I cherish things I'll never forget, experiences I'll never forget. And uh, yeah, for, for me, it was just like, it was just a, it's just been a fun journey. Mm. Um, again, I am not, I, I'm so like shocked and, and honored and surprised and, and humbled by being in that conversation. It's like, it's still like, it's still, even as you're saying it, I'm still like, wow. Wow, really? It's like, you know, me? Plenty more to get into during this conversation with Shelton Benjamin, but since we were talking about being ageless and at least holding off the appearance of aging, for me, the biggest thing here has been a skincare routine. And Tiege Hanley has been my go-to skincare routine for the last few years. And Tiege Hanley just makes it so easy because everything you need arrives in a box. You've got the wash, you've got the AM moisturizer, the PM moisturizer, and the scrub and it takes maybe i don't know a minute to a minute and 34 seconds in the morning and then the same amount of time at night and that's it Tiege has over seven thousand five star reviews including mine and they want to help you out by giving you 30 percent off your first box plus a free gift so 30 percent off and a free gift when you click that link down below it's both in the description and the pinned comment go get 30 percent off your first box and get yourself a free gift with Tiege hanley by clicking that link down below have you given any thought to who you think you might want to induct you you don't have to say the names, but you're mm. thinking about it. I've thought about it. I'm like that's that's really hard. I I've I've sat and thought about it a couple of times. You know, me and a couple other guys who, uh, when that when that originally came up, uh, me and some other guys kind of brainstormed. Like, you know, who do you think? And I was like, mm. like on the list, Kurt. Sure. Uh. Uh. uh Brock. Kurt Brock. Brock, I don't know. Brock might f five me. You know, you can't you can't trust him <laughs> with a handshake these days. So, um, uh, Gerald Briscoe. Um, so like like I said, I go deep with it. Uh, yeah, there's those are my even MVP mm. like like you know, people that are close to me that I that I that have been me f forever. Like those are the type of guys that I really will consider for that. But yeah. I would say if, if I were to have to make a decision today, yeah. it would probably be Kurt. Uh, and I'm sure he would be honored to do it. I, I would love for him to be Kurt. Cause he, he paid the way for guys like myself, Brock, uh, Gable. Yep. And uh, yeah, so I, I and, and again, he, he used his name to introduce me to the world. So it, it would be, for me, it'd be an honor if, if it were him. Kurt on his podcast said that like your amateur background was so, so good. And you didn't start till you were like a junior in high school. Yeah. Uh, right? I, actually a sophomore. I started, they, they Still, tried to come they, on. Yeah. So my, my coach is, his name was Raleigh Jackson. He tried to get me to come up my freshman year, but I was a fan of pro wrestling my entire life. So when they brought up me being an amateur wrestler, uh, again, I'm thinking at the time guys like, Sting, Flair, Taker, Warrior, and uh, I was like, where's the ring? Where are the ropes? Wait, we can't jump? Nah, I, nah I'm good. I don't, I don't need to do that. But uh, that same coach later, uh, he was also one of the football coaches. And football season overlapped with wrestling season. Mm. So after a long football practice, um, I'm about to walk home, and he goes, hey, Sheldon, you want to ride home? I'm like, yeah, sure, coach. And I get in this car. Now, mind you, I live at a time I could walk home. Ten minutes from the school, I could walk home, but yeah. he offered a ride. He drove me straight to wrestling practice. <laughs> I went from football practice, three hours of football practice, straight to two-hour wrestling practice for the first time, strong-armed into the – basically strong-armed <laughs> into the sport. And uh, and I never left. Like, he, he – uh, Coach Jackson, you know, he shows so much confidence in me and, and – my abilities based on just watching me, like a, as a young kid, like that someone taking that kind of interest in me, it really like touched me. 
And mm. so I never, I stayed to make him proud. Now he was on my coach for one year. He eventually got a job and then enters coach Ron Donlick. And this is the guy I credit as being uh, my Bundini. Like Mike Tyson had Bundini. Yeah. No, nah, I'm sorry. Mike Tyson had custom motto. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why I said Bundini was his hype man. <laughs> but uh but this is my custom motto because I was the you know typical bad kid and you know getting in trouble here and there and this man came into my life and he basically he quite literally would take me home to his family on the weekends so I couldn't get in trouble. Um and for me, again, I'm I'm a young poor black kid from South Carolina and he's white, so I'm not, I'm not used to being at this point aside from going to school and teaching the thing, I've never spent time with a white family. So the fact that he lived in Charleston, so he drove 80 miles every day to come to work. And the fact that he took his time, not just with me, with other guys on the team, and he completely transformed my life, completely transformed my outlook, and he's the guy I credit for all of my success. Wow, I'm fascinated by the idea that a moment or person or decision can change someone's life. Oh my God, he, like, Coach Donnelly, like I said, he is, like he's to me one he's what the word he's the type of person we need more of him in the world like he's just a great guy he's dedicated himself to you know to improving the lives of others and like i said i'm probably i would say i'm I'm probably his most popular pupil but there are dozens of us mm. that i mean love this like i said he would bring us into his family and treat us like his own he, he taught me about respect self-respect hard work and you know the virtues of all and like i said i have nothing but love for that man like he is he's the guy that got wow. me here okay we'll get right back to the conversation in just a second but do you want to sleep better and also do less laundry yes both of these are possible let me put you on the miracle maids bed sheets these are the best bed sheets you will ever own. So the reason you're gonna get a better night's sleep is because of the self-cooling properties here. Using silver-infused fabrics inspired by NASA, Miracle Made sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long. So you're gonna get a better sleep every single night. And because they're infused with silver, it prevents up to 99.7% of bacteria growth. So they'll stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. No more stinky sheets. And these are the softest sheets that I've ever slept on. These are like five-star hotel sheets without the five-star hotel prices. I mean, how great is it to not only sleep better, but also to not have to change your sheets as often. Give them a try by going to trymiracle.com slash CVV. They're already like 40% off right now, but use that code CVV at checkout. You'll get an additional 20% off and then three free towels as well. So that code is CVV at trymiracle.com slash CVV. And so you go on to become an All-American, two-time All-American, right? Uh, two-time All-American University of Minnesota, um, but I was also yeah. List them all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. In wrestling, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm a two-time state champ for at heavyweight from South Carolina. Um, I was I took third nationally, uh, so I was a high school All-American. Then I went to junior college, where I was a two-time All-American and national champion at heavyweight. Then I went to the University of Minnesota, where I was two-time All-American. And then I stayed on as a coach where I was Brock Lesnar's sparring partner for what about almost two years. Wow. And it's funny because people go, What what weight class were you? I was like heavyweight. And they're like, What weight class was Brock? And I'm like, heavyweight. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, you were wrestling Brock every day. <laughs> every well, I day. mean that explains why both of you guys are so, so good. Yeah, I mean that that guy is the most impressive athlete I've ever seen. Far do you remember the first time that you met Brock Lesnar? Yes, I do actually. And you know, I'm almost, uh, it, it almost annoys me to, to, to tell the story because we were at a, we were at a wrestling tournament in, I want to say it was Fargo. And you know, I was there at university and Brock was still in junior college. And of course we're in the same, you know, he's heavy and Long story short, he won the tournament because I, I lost the match and we we might we would have wrestled, but he won the tournament. And he was a junior college kid. And I just remember everyone, everyone who saw him, it was just like, 
oh my god do you, do you <laughs> see that do you like like i there's there's never been a scrawny version of brock that that i saw like from the time we saw him he was brock and it was like our coaches were salivating on him to the point where after this because he was junior college they started they immediately started recruiting him so i'm kind of over in the corner like you know, because you know, cause, you know <laughs> I'm I'm your heavyweight, and you're 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 uh, you're recruiting another heavyweight right in front of me. Like, but I mean, you see the guy. How could you not? Sure. So I remember my first introduction to him was seeing a a, a very grainy clip of him doing a shooting star press, and mm. I'm like, a man that big has no business doing a shooting star press. Right. The first time I saw him do it, we were we were in uh, Louisville, and uh, at OVW at OVW yeah. in Louisville, not. You know, not NXT, those guys are spoiled. <laughs> but we were in Louisville and, uh, you know, we were just in the ring, a, a few of us, just trying stuff. Just try, and I don't know who brought it up. And Brock just said, I can I can do that. <laughs> and we was like, really? I was like, yeah. So just like, get a crash pad. So we grabbed a crash pad and Doc, first time, <laughs> nails it. Wow. And so, of course, we go, okay, do it again. Goes up. Nails it, and he made it look so easy. And was so what was so crazy about his shooting star press was most guys kind of go right up and right down. Brock would go up and out and land in the middle of the ring rather than you know a little closer to the corner. And it was like with pinpoint accuracy, mm. like had a guy lay down, pinpoint accuracy. And it to your point, everyone's like, "How is he doing it?" Even I was like. How is he? I can't do that. Like I try, I I can't do it. And he is making it look effortless. So that that was, I knew he was strong. And of course I knew how good of a wrestler was because hey, I trained him. <laughs> but uh, when he, the first time I saw him do that, even I was like, oh, wait a minute. This is uncommon. Mm. I think that people see the version of Brock that we are presented on WWE and they, you know, they have an idea of like Brock, he's this monster. He's, you mm. know, he's, crazy athletic guy what tell us something about Brock Lesnar that we would be shocked to learn um something that you would be shocked to learn uh well yes every, everyone knows the Brock Lesnar persona yeah now if Brock is your friend he will give you the shirt off his back mm. nicest guy in the world fun cool to hang around with uh that that might surprise people how actually cool Brock can be if he likes you, <laughs> right? <laughs> Keywords, if he likes you. Um, but if he doesn't like you, he's, a, he's what, you, what you're seeing on TV, that's not an act. Wow. Like you're not seeing a different version of Brock. And you know, I, I spoke on this earlier, like Brock is not acting. Brock is not playing a role. Brock is Brock. What you're seeing, that's, that's real. Mm. Brock does not, he's not social. He doesn't give a blip. <laughs> like Brock is Brock, so yeah. you know, don't get it twisted. And yes, he's he's a world destroyer. I call him a juggernaut. Like Brock is, he's a bad boy. <laughs> when you look at the OVW class of 2002, mm -hmm. I mean, it is stacked, right? It's you, it's Brock Lesnar, it's Batista, it's John Cena, and it's Randy Orton. Right. Wow. Yeah. It's like looking back, it, it, like, holy cow. Oh, and it's Rico too. No disrespect yeah. to Rico. <laughs> no disrespect to Rico. Yeah. Um, but also like, you know, like, the, you know, obviously because of their, their huge successes, that's, you know, called the big four. Um, but I mean, there, there were other guys there also. We're talking uh, Eugene, Rob Conway, Jazz, Victoria, Nydia, uh, Big Show was there with us when he came. Wasn't Ron Waterman there too? Ron yeah. Waterman, uh, Brian Keck, you know, another wrestler. We, we used to call him No Neck Keck. <laughs> he was there. I mean, uh, it's just stacked. Like, yeah. That like, just so, like, is that just great timing? Is that what that the product it, of? So it, it was definitely the stars aligned. Like, um, it was, but I, I think what, what made our class really special was when we got there, one, everybody was hungry, and the, no one had been called up. Mm. So, it, like, I think Bull Buchanan 
might have been down there for a little while before he got he got called up for I think right to censor or something. But uh That's right, yeah. But for the most part for for all of us there, no one had been called up. So everybody was hungry. Mm. Really hungry. And because every everyone was really really cool guy. Everyone was a really cool guy. We all we all became really good friends and like everyone showed up early. Everyone stayed late. Everyone like tried to help the other. And because at the time there were there was OVW, there was HWA, and there was there was Memphis. So WWE had a few op pools of talent to pull from. So our philosophy was we want them to keep coming back to this pool. So we wanted to make sure everybody who got called up was over prepared. So that like I said, everybody worked to help everybody. And I think that plays a big role in why, you know, guys were guys and girls were as successful as as they were and have been. Like we were legit friends, we were iron sharpens iron and we were constantly trying to make each other better. Um, which again, I, I haven't been to any, I haven't trained at NXT, but I mean, so I don't wanna say those guys are guilty of that, but I do feel like there was a time when people were getting called up so quick that a lot of them weren't ready, mm. but it was because they, they kept seeing so many guys go up, oh, I'm gonna go up eventually. You know, it, for us, it's like we hope, we hope we go up. We wish they call us, you know. Mm-hmm. So, but I, like I said, for a time, I felt like guys were coming up so quick, they weren't. It was more expected that I'm going to go up. Then it's like, oh, I have to really work. To get yeah, there. the one word that's always attached to your career is underrated. Do you feel like you're underrated? Um. Yes, I from from a. From a from a in ring, actually, I should I should take this back. Um, I feel like I am a extremely good pro wrestler. Hell yeah! But of course. But that being said, at times I do feel like I could have been a better WWE superstar. I I see the differentiation that you're making here. All right. It, it's just it feels criminal that you never got a chance to win a world championship. Yeah, I mean, well. I, I, I've had two title matches, uh, but only one singles matches, and that was early in my career. And again, it's still something I, I'm I'm still proud of. It was it was against Eddie Guerrero, and so that was my you know again early. It was still a learning experience um, at the time. Clearly, I wasn't ready to be a world champ, but that was my singles match. And I think we had a later we had a, a tornado. I can't even remember what it's called. Some little, it was like five of us, me, Triple H, Jeff Hardy, uh, almost Spanky, and uh, oh, Brian Kendrick. Brian Kendrick, yeah, and uh, MVP. So, so there was that match, which it's not the same as having a singles match, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I still don't get me wrong. I still want one. <laughs> like I, I still want a shot. And you're um, still there. I'm still there. Yeah. So uh, the legs still work. And you know, you blow the whistle and that horse will run. So <laughs> <laughs> And you still look great, you still move great. I mean, there's really there's I from the outside looking in, mm-hmm. it feels like you have many more years doing this. I I feel like I got a few more. Um but because like I said, I am older. I have a few more, so I, I just have to be I would have to be really uh strategic in how to stretch that out long term. Um but yeah, there's definitely still a lot left in the tank and I can go with anybody at any time. And it's not just that you can go, you make everybody that you're in the ring with look so good. That's part of the job. <laughs> <laughs> One of the matches that people love to talk about with you, you, you know exactly where I'm going mm-hmm. with this. That match on Raw with you and Shawn Michaels, HBK himself has even said that's one of his favorite matches of all time. It is... Uh... I'm flattered that HBK says that because he has such a long list of great matches. Like, I mean, it's really hard to compete with that. But uh, but if he's saying flattered. that. But, but yeah, if he's saying it. Um, yeah, there, not a day goes by since I had that match where I haven't heard or seen some sort of comment basically compliment me for that match. Or 
you know, some some of our more some of our more pessimistic fans, you know, think oh, Sheldon got his head kicked off, you know, that type of stuff. But <laughs> but yeah, um, I learned really early. Um, it's all about creating memories for our fans. So no matter what I was doing in what capacity, I just wanted to do something memorable. Um, From about 20 seconds into that match, the chain wrestling that you guys are doing, mm -hmm. you're so invested as the audience watching this. You're like, oh my gosh, we're in for something so special right. here. Yeah, it, it was. So uh, Sean came up with most of that. Like I, I, like I was following his lead. And uh, he came up with, with most of that match. And and I want to say uh, Michael Hayes, you know, he had a lot of input. It was, The finish was Michael Hayes' idea. The and, springboard into right. the super kick? Yeah. Sorry, sweet chin music. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. not sweet the same Sweet chin music, move. yes, yes. <laughs> don't, don't, don't downgrade. It's not just a super kick. Yes, don't downgrade Sean's finish like so, that. So the springboard into the sweet chin music, that was Michael Hayes' that, idea? That if, if I'm remembering correctly, that was Michael Hayes' idea because he came up to me and as we were, the first thing he said, because they've seen me springboard and do things all the time, and he's like, Sheldon, do you think you could, do you think you could springboard into the ring, into, you know, into his, super, into his uh, sweet chin music? And I said, yeah. Like, it wasn't even, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, well, where does he need to be? I'm like, he can be wherever he wanted to be. I'm like, tell him. <laughs> Tell me where you need me to be, and I'll be there. I love it. And that was pretty much the end of that conversation. I, I think they just wanted to see me do it, just springboard, just to see how far I can get. I springboard and I jump almost to the other rope, and you know, because no one's kicking. I, they just want to see how far I can get. Yeah. Which was, I kind of when I when I actually did it, like I didn't jump as hard as I did when I practiced, because you know, obviously Sean's there, and I'm adjusting for where he's going to be. And uh, yeah, for me, it was like, hmm. I, I, I did, <laughs> yeah, no big deal. No. Uh, so I, I, a lot of things I did, and, and I'm not trying to be arrogant or anything. A lot of things I did, I didn't realize how special they were until other people pointed it out. But that's because you're so athletically gifted. Right. Like so <laughs> gifted in that Like I was, I wanted to call and say, hey, hey Ma, you remember all those beatings you gave me for climbing trees and jumping off buildings and swinging off? <laughs> it's not it's paying off right now. <laughs> <laughs> What's so impressive about that spot with the springboard and the sweet chin music is the change of direction, mm. right? You're going one way and then the sweet chin music hits you and then immediately you, you laid out. Yeah, perfect timing. Yeah, perfect it's all timing. about timing. Did you see the kind of tribute that they paid with that uh, between Logan Paul and Seth Rollins? So Logan Paul jumps off the top rope right into a super kick. Oh, yes, yes, Seth yes. I, 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 I've seen it. Yeah, I've, I've seen... I've seen quite a few uh, uh, remakes. <laughs> um, what was the reaction when you went to the back after that match? Because I would imagine that's a match that everybody is glued to the monitors watching. Um, so, standing ovation. Like I went through the, I went when I went back to the curtain. Like events and everyone's like clapping and like even Mike Hayes like you you did something special tonight and I was like, really like. Again, I didn't. I didn't realize how special it was. And then I then I you know I watched it back. And I was like, this match is great. And I'm like, it's really good. And but again, like I'm I'm so like, is it really that good? Like, I didn't I didn't think of it until it, it I kept getting it. Then the very next week, you know, the kick is is in the the opening promo. So I'm like, okay, now now I, I think I'm I'm starting to get it now. I'm starting to really get it. Um, is that your favorite WWE match of all time? Uh, no, my favorite match I probably won at the end, but <laughs> 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 no, that that from a from a technical storyline standpoint, that that's one of my top matches without a, without a doubt. Um, but I also say the night before I had a match with uh Jericho that I think is it was a pay per view. I can't remember the name of the pay per view. Is this the Taboo Tuesday thing? No, 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 no. That was our that was our first meeting. Okay, but we had a. Uh, the liter literally the night before uh, the Gold Rush match, I had a pay per view match with with uh, Chris Jericho, and that match was I I was blown away by it. Like that was one that's one of, that's actually one of my favorite matches ever, and it was the second time me and Chris had a pay per view match. So for me, 
I wrestled Chris Jericho, and we had a hell of a match. I actually won that one. <laughs> and then the next the next night, uh, you know, wrestling HBK, and having that 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 was the single greatest two nights of wrestling of of my career. Yeah. It has hasn't been top, and I don't think it can be top. I, I, <laughs> I you know, b- between the players and the actual action, like yeah. That those that was my best week ever. <laughs> <laughs> For Taboo Tuesday, when you wrestled Chris Jericho, did you truly not know that you were going to be his opponent? I had every belief that Batista would be facing Chris Jericho. But, you know, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Mm -hmm. WWE could have said, well, Shelton Benjamin won even if you didn't win the fan vote. Or Batista won even if you didn't win the fan vote. So they truly let this go to a fan vote. Me and and Chris have, have spoken of this. Our match was the only match where it was 100% we don't know what we're going to do. Every other match has some sort of gimmick involved. You know, you know, false called anywhere or a hardcore match or something. So sure. everyone they had some idea what they were going to do. They just, you know, and who with. Yeah. <laughs> Chris had 15 guys and they refused to give him any information. And he kept like he, you know, he kept trying. He was like, yeah, so who's it leaning towards? Who's leaning? like they wouldn't tell him anything. Me, I was expecting to be in the back watching the show, so I wasn't even asking anything. But Chris was trying to get an idea, so Chris was going around, going, you know, talking to guys. He goes, you know, say if he, you know, with the Dave's like, hey, do you know when I do this and I do this and like, and Dave would kind of go, you know, you know, I'm I'm just using Dave as an example. Sure. But he's just kind of getting an idea of do people know my stuff and yeah. just just trying to plant seeds to everyone. And he came to me and he's like, "Hey Shelton, do you do you know when I do this?" And I said, "I'll stop you right there, Chris. I know all your stuff." He's like, "Okay, okay. <laughs> I knew I didn't have to worry about you, so I'm gonna go. You know, maybe you have to figure out something with Jonathan Coachman." <laughs> but and like I said, when they announced the winner, I wasn't paying attention. Like I, I, I was waiting for them to say Batista's name. So, and if you look at the 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 tape, my reaction, it's a little delayed because I was like, oh, wait, me? me? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so that I knew nothing. Went down to the ring, I knew nothing. We hadn't called anything. There was all, like I said, Chris, I know all your stuff. Yeah. That's, that's, the, that's as much but as we said. But does Chris know all your stuff? No, apparently. <laughs> Because the first thing I, you know, any information was conveyed to him. The ref never told me anything. So when he, we locked up, and as soon as we locked up, he goes, what's your finish? I said, <laughs> I said T-bone. And he just kind of backed off, and then we locked up. And from there, I just listened. And he called everything. Wow. And I just, I just listened and followed. And when he said, okay, for, for, the, for the finish, he's like, all right, uh, stop short. I'm going to jump. Catch me in your finish. He still didn't know what my finish was. <laughs> so he just kind of jumped and turned and just did this. And I just got it, hit it with the T-bone, one, two, three. And I heard three, and I was like, wait, what? So you didn't even know the finish before you went out? Nothing. Wow. I We knew. If you go back and watch the tape, if you, if if the camera stays on, Chris, you'll see him say something to the referee. That's when he got the information. No one ever told me. Like, all I got was, what's your finish? He didn't say anything. <laughs> wow. 100%, 100% on the fly. That's unbelievable. Yeah. So that that's one of my, I'm, I'm that's one of my matches that I'm most proud of. Uh, because, like I said, because it was under pressure. I didn't expect to be working that night and we went out there and we pulled off a great match and it, it was so much fun and I was so proud of it. Like it's, it, it, again, it's one of my favorite matches. Little backstory though. I, I actually attribute the success of that match to my time working with Eddie Guerrero because uh, when me and Haas first came up, you know, we were straight out of developmental. So we're green. Yeah, We want to... We want to talk about everything, call everything, plan everything. Sure. Eddie and Chavo did not work like that. So, and we were married to them for the first eight months. So uh, 
when we would do like live events, like first we were just screwing up everything because they would hide from us uh, or they would come late or, you know, or they would say they were late just so they didn't have to, and we would have to go out and like, he would, Eddie would force us to call stuff in the ring. Oh, that must've been so nerve wracking. Oh, <laughs> like I said, for, for th- the first month, it was nerve wracking because we were, we, at the same time, Eddie was kind of starting to develop his lie, cheating and steal stuff. So he's trying to develop these things and we were blowing his spots. Like we were, cause we didn't know. Cause he did, he wasn't telling us he was just doing. And mm-hmm. then I think after, after we had a match and we just kind of screwed up, me and Charlie were just screwing up everything. Like Eddie was mad, Chad was mad. Like you guys are making us look bad out there. You're doing this. And, and I think I spoke up and I said, look, I know I am just, I just, my foot's just in the door. If I left today, no one would, would remember me, but I'm not a child. I admit I'm green. I don't know what you're doing. You're not telling us. So if you want to yell at me, yell at me after I screw up doing something that I've been taught. Mm. Like you got to at least teach me first. If I screwed up after that, you know, that, that's a different story, but yeah. you got, you got to teach me first. Yeah. I, I, you know, a little verbal. You don't have to walk me by the hand the whole time, but you got to give me something. Yeah. Because like, I don't, I literally don't know what I'm doing to screw you up. Mm. And Eddie, uh, he was like, he kind of thought it over and like, you know what? Yeah, you're right. I got to be a better leader. And at the time, even the, the office thought like, you know, the, the story of the, of the blow up made it sound like we were like ready to get in fist fights and everything. So I, I think, uh, one of the, one of the well, someone from management asked me, he's like, uh, so what happened with Eddie? And I said, nothing. Mm. Like, we had a talk and that was it. And and uh, I later spoke with Eddie and I'm like, yeah, the office came and asked me, you know, you know, was were you were you in travel step, overstepping your grounds or being, and I was like, and I told him like, I told him no. Cause you know, I'm old school. I, 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 I've been in the locker room my whole life. And for me, you don't you don't go run to a higher authority. If we have a problem, we fix the problem. Mm-hmm. So and I told him like I'm a, I'm I'm one of the boys. If I thought you did that, I would address it with you. But yeah, I'm not gonna throw you under the bus. Even if I'm even if I'm even if I'm mad, yeah. I'm not gonna throw you under the bus. Uh, I'm just not that person. And I swear to God, Eddie kissed me on the forehead, said thank you, and from that point on, he was like my biggest mentor. Wow. So like I said, he started leading me to the point where, the, like I said, the, we were married for eight months straight on live events. The first month was rough. After about you know six weeks, we had to blow up. And then for the next couple of weeks, he started actually teaching us the things he were doing. And then for the next five, for the next five months, like we got so good and we're having so much, we never talked. We were going live events, we never talked. Every day, it was like a day off. I couldn't wow. wait to get to work. Like he, like all of his, and he, he was so good because he would like, we had cues. Like if he initiated anything, like we knew, okay, he's about to do this spot. He's going into this situation. And at one point, and like I said, Eddie was really proud of this because it was 100% on the fly. We're in the ring. Uh, Eddie goes and grabs the wrench from the, from the, you know, that, that they ring the bell with, he grabs a wrench and he goes, Chavo, push, push Shelton over here. Just push Shelton over here. So he put, Chavo pushing me on the, on the rope. And I'm kind of like, you know, let, let me go. Let me, you know, waiting for the ref to push him back. Yeah. And Eddie just kind of goes and he taps my hand with the wrench. And I just said it like, I just got shot in the hand. Like, oh my God, I'm like complaining. You know, we do that a couple of times. And so the ref goes like, so Eddie, like, show me your hands. Eddie does this. Eddie does this. You know, turn around, like, you know, checking his feet. He goes to check Eddie's feet. Eddie tosses the wrench to Chavo, who's in the middle of the ring, you know, watching this. And I go, hey, Chavo's got it. So Chavo goes. The ref starts, you know, checking Chavo. The wrench is in the back of Chavo's trunk. The ref's checking one hand, one hand, one foot. Charlie comes in from our corner, from behind Chavo, grabs the wrench and goes, it's right here. And then the ref goes, you got a wrench, you got to get out of here. It's like, <laughs> and we just made, that was 100% of the fly. And it, it was so much fun. Like, and I remember we were, after we were, we were laughing and talking about how, and it was like, dude, 
we got over a freaking wrench, you know, just on the fly. It, it was so amazing. much funny. So, like I said, as far as following guys, like, yeah. and and again, his teachings benefited me with Hunter, with Taker, with. I mean, the list goes on. Right? Yes, you, you did a program with Flair. Yes, and the, the the amount of people that you've worked with, and I'm sure learned from as a result. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I got. I got an impressive list. Like I will say that. Like, you know, I I I've been in the ring with Ric Flair, who I watched as a kid. I I've never known pro wrestling without Ric Flair. I've been in the ring with The Undertaker, Edge, Christian, Rey Mysterio, Cena, Brock, you know, all, you got clearly, a win on Triple H. Got yeah, I got a few wins yeah, on Triple right, H. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I I've been I've been really blessed, man. Like like I, if you look at my resume and like the stuff that I've done, like the talent I've worked with, I, I can only describe it as blessed. Yeah. Because of, of those people, who do you think you learned from the most? Ooh. Wow. That's. I still say Eddie, because again, I was married to him for for yeah. eight months. Um. But I've said this before. Every time I wrestle Shawn Michaels, learning experience. Every time I wrestle Triple H learning experience every time I wrestled Undertaker learning experience every time I wrestled Rey Mysterio learning experience like mm. so I'm constantly learning from from all of these great guys but at the same time uh I'm learning from people behind the scenes too Arn Anderson was the brains behind Team Angle like Kurt was the figurehead but as far as like our moves and our style and how we developed as a team yeah Arn Anderson um, and I feel like we're seeing like a modern day version of that right now with Alpha Academy. Yeah, Chad Gable and Otis, or I, I just feel like it's kind of a modern day team angle. Yeah, I, 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 I would say definitely that. But first of all, Gable, hmm. holy cow! Like that guy is a workhorse. Like he is such a badass. Like, I, like he, I don't think he realized how much respect I, I have for him. That guy is a badass. <laughs> so, and to see him, like, like I said, he's turned on his comical chops. Like, it's like, and he's constantly surprising me. And he's a guy who I'm like, this would be a breakout star. And I know mm. we're, we're constantly trying to develop new and talent, but I'm like, man, this guy has got it all. Mm. Like he's, he, like he's my favorite worker. Like, cause you can put him in the ring with anyone. He can make him look good can toss anybody around, you know, like I said, when he, you know, when he tossed Braun Strowman, it's like, Jesus, <laughs> my God, <laughs> dude, like, you're not supposed to be able to do that. <laughs> but, like, man, I, I'm, I'm so impressed by his work, like, so impressed. So if Arn Anderson was the one who came up with Team Angle, whose idea was it for your mama? That would be one Mr. McMahon. <laughs> um, uh, so I think things were getting a little stale for me. I was on this long losing streak and this is after the gold standard, right? No, this is before oh, the that's gold right standard. before the gold standard. Um, and I, I, you know, I had a meeting with Vince and I was just like, okay, well, right now I'm, I'm, I'm not doing anything. Like I, I want to contribute. And I, and I had a idea and like first when he, I don't know where he came up with the mama thing. Um, so when he first approached me about it, he basically said, so how, how would you feel about having your real mama on the road with you or, or doing this role? And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> there is no way I'm going to expose my mother to this locker room because as nice as a guy I am, I love everybody on the roster, but if one person were to say something Cross to my real mom. Yeah, I would. I I would have had a really short career. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I. And so we, like I said, when he said it, I was just kind of like, hmm. Because the the only reference I had to that was Buff Bagwell and his mom with that was Judy. Yeah, yeah, and and I guess Jim Cornette used to always reference his mom back way back in the day, but I. I don't remember if she ever made a television appearance, but I definitely remember the buff stuff. Yeah, and his mom was on a forklift match. <laughs> <laughs> Vince Russo is even like, yeah, it was a pretty bad idea. Yeah. 
so um so when things started with that um i feel and, and i've said this before i feel like it get that whole storyline gets a bad rap because uh my my mom uh, thea vidal who's a you know she's a comedian and you know she's been on tv shows like i said me and brandy have a mother in common me and the singer brandy have a mother in common <laughs> um when they brought her in like they narrowed it down to just her and two other her and one other woman and yeah it was like as soon as she walked in i knew exactly who she was and I oh, go, so you were part of the casting yes oh. um it was me um one of our producers uh her name's kasama and vince like we like ultimately they left it down to me and but everyone agreed thea like she blew it out of the water and the day you the day she did that audition in front of us was the day she made her debut on television. We made a decision wow. that day. And uh, like she was a lot of fun to work with uh, on camera because she obviously she was way more animated than me, but you know, I it was easy to slip into that whole mama's boy role because like she had a she had a very domineering personality to say the least. Um and I was having a lot of fun with it. Like so, some of the skits, like particularly when, you know, I walked in with her, you know, her with Miss, Miss McMahon with his pants down. Like, <laughs> like that's, I, like I was having so much fun with that. And, but uh, unfortunately, like she has some medical problems and, you know, some other, some other things that, you know, uh, I guess management wasn't happy with, you know, basically she got let go. Mm -hmm. And and this, but the she got let go before the story could be completed. You know, the story. You know, that's that's kind of a, a buzzword these days. The yeah, story. Finish the story. Right. Yeah. So we didn't finish the story because, like I said, I was I was supposed to be a mama's boy. You know, and and, and successful. But but at some point, I had to grow up and stand on my own without my mom again. Yeah. And that's what that's that's where that was leading. That's what that's that's where I was. You were gonna turn on your mama. No one turns on their mama. <laughs> no black guy turns on his mama, right? <laughs> like, no smart person no turns. No smart on their person mama. turns on their mama. <laughs> um, so that so it, it, it was more like I was, I was basically going to take my manhood back, and because everything got cut off and it got, you know, it ended so abruptly because yeah. most people go, oh man, I remember when you did the mama's the mama's boy thing with mama. How's mama? And like, man, how that. Like for six months or so, like, like it wasn't six months. Like, well, how long was it? Because it seemed like it was it last long time, from start to finish. Eight weeks. This is this, the hilarious thing about wrestling fans in our memories is when something is memorable. Mm -hmm. Oh man, you did that thing for like six and eight yeah. months, a year. Yeah. And when something's not memorable, it could have lasted a year. And you <laughs> went, oh, I don't even remember that thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. Six. I'm sorry, eight weeks. Wow. So it, and, but the funny thing was the, the immediately, like they said, well, mama's not coming back. So now your characters are, you know, a cocky, a cocky, like, you know, Deion Sanders type. And I was yeah. just like, huh? <laughs> wait, wait, last week I was a mama boy, you know, cowering to my mom. And this week I'm, I'm, I'm the flashy, I'm supposed to be this flashy Deion Sanders type. I'm like, uh, okay, we'll try it. But I mean, it. I, I think it, it was too abrupt to change. But no, mm. there was no sort of the, there was no closure or explanation for why Mama wasn't there, or why I was acting like this now. And it's like, so to me, I don't, th I don't think that really worked because the there was no transition. It was like for the last eight weeks, you've been this cowering guy to your mom. Now it's like, well, where's your mom? Mm -hmm. you know because people love her like no matter what i i i've i read stuff online which you probably shouldn't do because you're only going to remember the bad stuff really yeah so i would read stuff online about how people thought it was you know was a bad thing and i was like i was having a time in my life you know how many pre-tapes i did with mr mcmahon i was like i was getting so much work so much tv time and having so much fun with this and then it ended abruptly and like i said from a story wise from a story standpoint we never got to complete the story we just literally yeah. flipped the page and i'm a new character one week from the next and it just doesn't that to me it just didn't work but it ends up leading into the gold standard which is i think the thing that 
people remember you most for, mm -hmm. at least from your singles career? Yeah. So the gold standard. Uh, I feel like we're prepping for something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Let's sit up straight. Uh, gold yeah, standard. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I had been toying with the idea of dyeing my hair because they put us, they, they reformed world's greatest tag team. Yep. And while Charlie, I love Charlie to death. He's my brother, best friend. And, uh, but at the time I tasted single success to me going back into a tag team was a step backwards. And so I was thinking, okay, what can I change about myself that, or what can I add or do to make myself to, to, to basically change it up, make myself yeah. more interesting, more marketable. Yeah. And, but I didn't want to do anything so drastic that if I didn't like it, I couldn't just kind of morph back. So I was yeah. like, uh, hmm. And I can, I thought about dyeing my hair blonde, but I always held off uh, because at the time, uh, Viscera still had the blonde mohawk, you know? So for me, I would be encroaching on his, his gimmick. So, sure. um, when he became Big Daddy V, and you know, at this time now I'm in the tag team, and I, I went to him, I said, hey, you think about dyeing my hair blonde, you, you mind if I, he's like, I don't care, I'm not doing blonde anymore, like knock, it, knock yourself out. Mm. So because I had his blessing, I was like, okay. And what, fin what finally made me pull the trigger on it, I don't even think he knows this, but uh, Stone Cold had addressed the, the talent, you know, talking about, you know, Come out of the show, making you know, working harder to be a star, like taking risks and all these things, and and it was that day. Like I'm listening to Stone Cold, and I'm going. I think there was a hint of ask for forgiveness, not permission. Yeah. And I that day I was like, I walked out of that meeting. I went to one of the one of the girls who uh, does hair. I was like, hey, would you bleach my hair for me? And I bleached it. Was, that, she, that was she like, uh, we need to ask somebody first? Nope. Wow. Nope. I just said, okay, will you dye my hair for me? She's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so she, she dyed it blonde, and no one knew I did it until I, well, I, obviously, people saw me, but Vince and management didn't know I did it until we went out, me and Charlie went out for our match, and I walked to a gorilla, and now I have this, <laughs> this blonde hair. And it did exactly what I wanted it to do. It created a buzz. It started questioning. It gave people different ideas. And uh, what ended up happening, uh, Dusty Rose, who was in charge of ECW at the time, he was, I remember he said it, he wanted me to come to ECW. Yeah. And <laughs> I remember he said, you know, this might be a horrible Dusty Rose impression, but he goes, he's like, he's like, you got, you got talent and they got, you got talent and they don't know how to use it, but I do. So I say, give you to me. And so when I, I don't know, me and Charlie might've been tagging for a couple months, if that, and I got moved to ECW and the gold standard was born. Wow. And so that, that first few few months does, was Dusty's program. And I think he had told me uh, his plan was to have me and Punk face each other at Mania for for the ECW title. Wow, yeah. Obviously that didn't happen. You know, he he ended up, uh, he changed position. I think he started working with developmental or something. So when that happened, pretty much that story stuff, that stuff fell apart. But at the same time, I was still in ECW and the gold standard thing was thriving. And yeah, that was, I was having so much fun with it, both in the ring and in, and in my personal life because I didn't dye my hair as a fat, because I thought I would look cool with blonde hair. I dyed my hair to stand out because, you know, there's no saying if you look like the people on the other side of the rail, you should be on the other side of the rail with them. Mm. Like that was a philosophy back then. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to stand out a little more. So now when I'm going, but now I have a, I have blonde hair 24 <laughs> seven. <laughs> now you stand out everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. And it's funny to, to watch people's reaction to me with the blonde hair because if they didn't know who I was, the, the, the particularly in airports, the first looks was like. But did they think you're a rapper, football player? 
I, I think because of, because of my bill, they knew it was something. Yeah. But in a lot of cases, it was just like, <laughs> what's this guy do? And then I, I could sit and watch people and I could see wheels start turning and someone goes and then you go, and it's like, oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> and then now, now you got, yeah, now you got yeah, lines yeah. for me to get autographs. And so I, I, I you said, passed the the airport test that everyone yeah. talks about. <laughs> yeah. All you had to do is dye your hair. Yeah, blonde blondes really do have more fun. It's, <laughs> it's not just a slogan. <laughs> so yeah, so I I loved it. Like just like I said, just because it, it gave me a look, it helped you know. Yeah. And uh, I sometimes I wonder if I should go back to it. I, I think you should. I'd, 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 I don't know. I don't know if I can. There's, ah, you've got it. You've got the, the, plenty the, of hair up there. There's a reason I keep it low these days, man. <laughs> <laughs> when I told people that I was going to be sitting down with you today, one of the biggest things that came up was people miss your entrance theme. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I have been trying. Uh, fans, anyone listening, I, I've been trying. I've asked over and over since the day I got back. And I hear there ain't no stopping you. So yeah, I hear there ain't, there ain't no stopping me. I haven't stopped. I'm still trying. I and I just keep going, please. Like I, I'm. I was. I was making it very public that I don't like my theme music. I want my old music, and like for re, you know for reasons that even I, I don't know if I'm even willing to accept it. They may be true. They may be true. I don't know if I'm willing to accept it. But you know, they just they haven't conceded to giving me back my old music because I want it too. I think if you keep putting it out there, they got uh, no choice. Yeah, you know what I. I what I think is fans to just chant it anyway while I'm in the ring. Like if if you wanna if you wanna send a message, like me asking is enough. You fans have to demand it. <laughs> you know how many people are gonna tweet it after hearing this? <laughs> you're either gonna get your theme song back or you're gonna get in trouble. I'm gonna, so. Yeah, I'm gonna get in so much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll apologize in advance then. <laughs> when you left WWE and you went and Went to Japan. You had some amazing work there. Did you ever think that you would find your way back to WWE? Um, honestly, yes. Mm. I I I was always under the belief, and you know, I, I I just believe that if you were ever successful in that company, there's always a chance you'll come back. Yeah. Um. With 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 WWE, I, I strongly believe never say never because there are people who have come and gone and came and gone again. And I'm like, wow, I'm surprised you're even entertaining the idea, much less allowing this person to return. Uh, case in point, like Eric Bischoff, from a historical standpoint, when you look at this, this was the enemy. This was the guy that was trying to take you down. Now, yeah, that seems like an obvious one. Yeah, like that, and this, this is, now this is, you know he's he's worked with them many times, and you know yeah. that, that's not a that's not a knock on Eric Bischoff, of course. You know, but it's it's just like I said, if 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 we're at war, when the war is over, I don't give you a job. Like that's <laughs> that's just me. But yeah. uh, but I but nobody has anything bad to say about you, right. and I think that is a tribute to who you are as a person and a performer, obviously. Mm. But uh, it feels like it would just make sense to have you back, and then the stuff you were doing with um, uh, with her business. Mm -hmm. it, really good stuff yeah yeah the hurt business is that that's that's that will always be something i hold near and dear i consider it one of the greatest accomplishments one of the greatest uh factions one of the greatest situations like i have nothing but love for the hurt business like nothing but love i feel like that that time that we were in the world when we <laughs> couldn't do mm -hmm. anything and all eyes were on pro wrestling because it was the only live programming you guys, so, like that that faction excelled so much during right. that time. Yeah, I, you know, again, with the world being in the situation it was, like, and, you know, in, in a lot of cases, limited talent, you know, for, for safety, obviously every, everything's understandable, yeah. but, but the company still needed people to step up. Like, yes, we understand what's going on, but we're still a business. You know, the show must go on. We need people to step up, and I think myself, Bobby, MVP and Cedric did exactly that. And like I said, I, what we created, like I said, all of us are extremely proud of what we were able to do, especially during that time when the company really needed something. Mm. And 
Like I said, that came out of nowhere. It was it was a surprise to all of us. And again, it, it was just such a great time. Uh, the biggest regret is that we never were in front of a live audience. I feel like that's there's still more to that story. I definitely I, I first of all, I think there there I think there are more books and novels for her business like personally like i um but you know when because when, when things as all things do when things fell apart like i don't think any of us were happy about it um matter of fact no none of us were happy about it i don't we, think we, fans we, weren't happy we, about it yeah we did everything we could uh it was above our pay grade and our job is to perform yep the you know the decision makers have made the decisions our job is to perform so that's what we do but at the same time, it's like, man, we really, really wanted to just have that one time we could just walk out in front of a an actual crowd, you know, because it's, it's one thing to know that you're, what you're doing is getting over when there's no one around, you know, but we still felt it. Mm. So we wanted to, you know, we all wanted to just experience, okay, the Hurt Business in front of a live audience. Mm. Like that's, you know, that that's what that's what we work for. That's what we live for. Yeah. You know, that adrenaline rush. There's there's nothing like it. How much do you think about life after wrestling? Lately a lot more. Um I like I feel like I'm always gonna be involved in, in in some way. Have they said anything to you like when you're done in the ring, we've also got a job for you backstage or maybe um, that's I, I've, I've I've had those talks. Like I, I, I do feel like I, ha I have a a uh, uh, an, another career behind the scenes. Yeah, you were telling me before we started recording. You're like, I don't even like to be home for that long. So yeah, yeah. If you continuing to be on the road makes a lot of sense, then absolutely. Like, like I <laughs> said, I if I'm home for two weeks, I get antsy. I something's wrong. Like I'm not earning. I'm not being productive. I I have to. Traveling is traveling and, and performing and doing stuff. And like I said, meeting people, networking, all of these yeah. things. If I'm sitting at home, I'm not doing any of those things. So, yeah, so you don't feel productive, but you're I, one of those, uh, you know, it, it's, it's rare mm -hmm. to be one of those people who's comfortable living out of a suitcase, who's comfortable airport to airport, hotel to hotel. Love it. Piece of cake. I <laughs> doesn't bother me one bit. And I wow. hear, you know, I know some guys like, uh, you know, would wish they could have days off. Or, and, and a lot of people go, how do you do that every week? I'm like, the reason I can do it every week is that at no point was I taught that I couldn't. I guess a lot of guys just don't <laughs> like the routine though of like, now I got to find a new gym in this city. Now I got to go find a new place to find some relatively healthy food. That's to me, that's the adventure. <laughs> like, I love it. Because here's the thing. You think about how many people who work a regular nine to five they're in the same city every day. In the same office. In the same office, seeing yep. the same people, you know, driving the same route. Preach. Having the same mundane routine that, to me, would drive me crazy. I, on the other hand, now mind you, there's, there, there are some things that I, I, that I do regularly, just like anybody else with a job. I regularly get up early to catch a flight, to drive somewhere, to get beat up and beat up my friends. <laughs> To, to live out of a hotel and but at the same time I'm going to it's nothing for me to say oh today I'm in London yeah and I'm doing a show but before I do the show I'm gonna go check out this and I'm gonna see this I'm gonna see these sites I I literally get to see the world for free yeah first class not free you're getting paid to do yeah, it yeah <laughs> I mean I'm getting paid to do it but 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 my my company pays to send me around the world to some of the nicest places and some of the scariest places also, but to, I get to experience all these different cultures, you know, in small increments, Yeah. but I get to see the world. Me being from South Carolina, I'm, I'm from Orangeburg, South Carolina. I never left home when I was a kid, like ever. I was always Orangeburg. So until I started playing sports, that's when I actually started even seeing the state. So for me, the fact that I get paid to travel the world because for me, the wrestling part's fun. It's the fact that I can go to I can go to Europe, I can go to Asia, I can go, you know, I can go to all these different countries yeah. and in this country. And one, I always meet new and interesting people, uh, make connections, make friends. I 
my worldly views are much more expanded than the average person who just sits that who the average person who lives in one state or yeah. the average person who never leaves the country. Yeah. Like I, I have references for all these things and I've, my, I've lived a charm life. So when, anytime I see like, you know, cause a lot of fans, you know, who come to my defense, so, you know, cause I read this stuff like, you know, so they're better or, or any time I see the, the phrase poor Shelton, I want to say to that fan, no, not poor me. Because, like I said, I get to see the world for free. I get paid a handsome salary. I have not worried about a bill in over 20 years. My kids uh, have never needed for anything. Not poor Shelton. Shelton is doing real good. Mm. So I don't, no matter what you think creatively, I'm not blind to my blessings. I've, like, I've lived a charm life. I'm living a charm life. Like, I can go anywhere in the world almost, and people who don't know me will treat me like gold just because they saw me on TV, you know, wrestling for a good. Like, to yeah. me, that's a gift, and, I, and I'm still humbled by it. And even today when someone says they know me, like, I'm still humbled by that stuff. So, and sometimes I, I, I've said, I, maybe I'm too humbled, but, <laughs> but, like, I appreciate my life. I've lived a blessed life. Never use the term poor shell with me. Save your pity for the weak. <laughs> But you have been, you are, you are so humble. You've been so humble during this entire conversation. And I'm so grateful for just who you are. Don't be humble for like 30 seconds here, okay? <laughs> what okay. is it about you that has allowed you to have the amazing career that you've had over the last two plus decades? Um, and don't be humble for a second. Don't. <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> <laughs> no, because I'm a bad mother. You know? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I, that's, that's, I don't. I don't even know how to answer that question because I can help you because you work really hard. Well, yeah, because I, I, you I'm are. To put the time in. You are really good at taking direction. Yes, I'm you're incredibly good. gifted as an athlete. Yeah, um, I can't agree with. I can't disagree <laughs> with any of that. Um, you you have I, a student mentality towards everything, even now. Yeah, but like, like I said, even then, but I. Like I, I guess one of my biggest flaws is still to me one of my biggest assets is that, is that I'm humble. Like, like it's I'm. There are a lot of diverse personalities in the pro wrestling business, both in ring and office, and I think a big part of my success is that I've always, to your point, managed to keep a good relationship with everybody. Yeah. Like I can't, I can't really think of anybody in the industry that. I personally have beef with, or that I'm aware has beef with me. Mm. I've heard, I've heard a random story here and there about you know concerning people that I really don't know, but for the most part, I I'm a, I'm I'm big on respect. Yeah, like I'm, I'm I've been in locker rooms all my life, so I, I know how to navigate locker rooms. And like I said, I I think because I'm humble and I always try to treat people with respect, I'm. I use sir, ma'am, please and thank you as often as possible. Um, to me, those things uh, go a long way. It even even when you when you when you're very talented, like just just certain social skills take you a lot. Like I got my I got my contract with WWE not because of my athleticism, because of I mean obviously it helped. But what kind of got my foot in the door was was my social skills, my reputation, because originally WWE had gotten wind of Brock, and they contacted the University of Minnesota to quote you know about inquiring about Brock. And Jay Robinson, my coach at the time, he's like, yeah, well, you know, Brock still got a couple years, so you can't really talk to him. Like it's NCA NCA violation, but I have another guy. His name's Sheldon. He was a heavyweight before, and he is just, if not more, interested. Now, he didn't have to make re that recommendation, but because he knew I loved wrestling, yeah. because he knew I was a hard worker, because he instilled it in me, and l my reputation and good name, I feel like, helped get me that recommendation. Mm. So things like that, like I'm very, 
conscious of how I treat people. Mm. And don't get me wrong, nobody's perfect. I'm pretty sure there's somebody out there who goes, no, I saw Skelton. And, and, I doubt and it. He, you know, no, no. <laughs> I, can, I can name at least one that I know for sure because I just didn't like the guy. But, uh, but I try to treat everybody with, with respect. And uh, again, I, I attest that to my long career just as much as I do my, my physical abilities. Because um, I, I, I feel like the physical side of things, that, that's an easy answer. I know I've met and worked alongside guys who I consider way more talented than me, but they didn't last five minutes in the business because of the attitude, mm. not because of their skill, mm. attitude, coachability, likability. You know, they're, you know, can you, you know, it's important to be able to get along in a pro wrestling locker room. We got to trust each other. We got to like each other. And even if we don't like each other, we still got to trust each other to a, to a degree. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's the perfect way to answer that question. <laughs> Sir, it has been a, an absolute pleasure, an absolute honor to sit down with you. Thank you for making the time here in Las Vegas. There's a lot of things you could be doing in Las yeah. Vegas. Yes, but hey, you know what? I, I, I feel like I need to do more of this. I, I don't think I don't I don't think fans really know my personality except you know they get a lot of my humor when I'm like taking shots at Mia. By the way, by the way, do we have time to take shots at Mia? <laughs> You know, sure. You know, <laughs> any, any chance I get, I'll, I'll take a shot at Mia. <laughs> so Mia Yim walked into a library. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I end every conversation talking about gratitude because it's such an important part of my life. Mm -hmm. I wake up every day. I say out loud three things I'm grateful for. It's also what I do before I go to bed. Mm -hmm. So it's the question I ask at the end of every interview. What are three things in your life that you're grateful for as we sit here right now, Shelton? Well, um, I'm grateful to still be healthy, first and foremost. Um, I'm grateful that I am the father of two beautiful, talented, you know, just loving, caring daughters. Like everything I do is for them, um, whether they realize it or not. Um, and... Like I said, I'm really grateful for the life that I have because, again, from my background, it, it could have gone way south of this. And by way south, I mean I could be, you know, six feet under right now based on my projection pre-Coach Ron Donnelly. Mm. You know, every, but everything he's taught me, I everything that I've talked about today, as far as being humble and respectful, all, this, all of these things were really instilled in me by Coach Donnelly. And it's something that I teach. I try to teach to everybody, every all of my pupils. You know, because I'm, you know, I'm kind of trying to help out. You know, Zilla, Fatu, and everything like that. Yeah, that's Umaga's son. Yes, um, we both watched debut. Yeah, at reality wrestling. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm so proud of that kid. Cause There's, he's got a bright future. Yeah, I, I met him when he was six. <laughs> and, wow. And my, they were my next door neighbors. So funny story. He used to sneak in my house. I had a cupboard, you know, full of candies and snacks. And he used to sneak in my house and, 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 and grab my <laughs> and grab my candies and run out my side door. But uh, so because they were my next door neighbors, so like to me, they're family. So yeah, to see him and you know, I'm enjoying watching his journey. Mm. And you know, there there are a few other uh, kids that I you know I keep an eye on, obviously. Uh, Shaq Gaspar, who's a good friend of mine, like I keep a real close eye on his son and try to help out there whenever I can. Um, but yeah, like I'm, I guess I'm grateful for my ability to, you know, try to pay it forward some. That's great. So this has been so much fun. <laughs> thank you so much, oh, sir. Thank you. I mean, it went by so fast. That was I'm really like, fast. It was like an hour plus, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah, and I think we have people waiting out. Look, everyone's like, oh my gosh, is that Sean Benjamin? <laughs> it is. Thank you, sir. Thank you.